everyone to another semester of Frontiers in the Environment. My name is Todd Rubel, and I'm really glad that you're here with us today. In just a few moments, I'm going to be introducing our featured panel for the day. But before we do that, I thought I would just start with a few slides to kind of set the stage for today's discussion. First, though, I have a bit of a disclosure to make, and that's that I actually grew up on a cattle ranch in western South Dakota. So from a very young age, I had experience with raising cattle and the entire process that that entails. But since that time, I've actually become a vegetarian. So I've experienced this issue from a number of different, different perspectives and different ways of looking at this particular issue. So let's dive into this big question of whether or not we should eat meat. Also, I want to begin with another question, though, and that's how much meat do you think Americans eat per capita each day? Well, you might be surprised to realize that according to the OECD, in 2014 in the US, and this is just for beef, chicken, pig, and sheep, we consumed about 198.4 pounds per capita in the United States. Around the world, that number, though, is closer to 75 pounds. And what we expect to see over the next 10, 10 years, according to this OECD data, is that meat consumption in the US is going to increase to around 207.5 pounds for just those four animals I mentioned a moment ago. And then globally, we're going to see that number jump up to 78.3 pounds. So we have meat consumption per capita increasing at the same time that the global population is also increasing. Now, the changes we see across the different animals we eat, though, won't be the same. For some animals, they'll increase, and for others, there will be decreases. For beef consumption per capita globally, it's going to stay about the same. For chickens, we're going to see a slight or pretty significant increase. For pigs and swine, the numbers may actually decrease a little bit. And then for sheep, we're going to see a pretty substantial increase also. Now, this is a good place in this presentation to just pause for a moment and say that there are some really significant benefits to meat consumption and meat production. There are benefits that are economic and employment benefits. There are benefits to small rural communities up, on to up all the way to large companies and large corporations. And there's the obvious that meat right now feeds billions of people all around the world. In addition, there are pretty, some pretty strong cultural components associated with meat and meat consumption. I mean, if we think about Thanksgiving, one of the first things that comes to mind is probably the Thanksgiving turkey. So there's a deep cultural aspect to consuming meat also. But as many of you in the room know, there are also significant impacts to meat consumption. And I don't have to go through all these impacts with all of you because you're well aware of these different impacts. But I just want to say that the reason we're seeing so many of these impacts is because the sheer number of farm, farm animals on the planet is pretty astounding. For cattle at any point in the year, there are roughly 1.5 billion head of cattle we may see up to 19 billion chickens, around 1 billion pigs, and nearly another billion sheep. So that's a lot of animals around the planet at any one point in time. Among those animals, if we look just at the numbers for cattle, sheep, goat, and buffalo, their numbers have been increasing annually by about 25 million animals each year. Now, that's a lot of animals. I mean, by comparison, that's the size of the world's third largest metropolitan area that we're adding in just that subset of farm animals each and every year. And in order to have all these animals on the planet, we obviously need to feed all these animals. And feeding these animals differs from country to country. If we look at our own research from the Global Landscapes Initiative here at the University of Minnesota, we see that in India, for example, about 10% of crop calories are going to feed animals. In China, that number is closer to 33%. And in the US, it's about two thirds. And these numbers are actually going up, too. Preliminary data from the North Star Initiative, also here at the Institute on the Environment, shows that back in 2012, around 3 billion bushels of corn were fed to cattle, swine, and chicken that were raised for meat consumption here in the US. And of course, with all that corn being produced, there are obviously some CO2 impacts that go along with the production of that corn. Now, so far I've mentioned just land-based animals, but there are obviously some pretty significant impacts also to marine life. There was a recent report that came out from the WWF not too long ago saying that we've seen up to a 52% decline 
in marine vertebrate populations since 1970. And this report went on to say that the fish that constitute up to 60% of protein intake in coastal countries is declining precipitously. So this is an issue both on land and in water. Beyond these impacts, there are also impacts to each one of us. There are human health impacts from our changing global diets and our increased meat consumption. And that's something we're definitely going to get into with the panel here today, too. If we step back for a moment to take a look at the recent headlines, there's a lot of coverage related to consuming meat happening all around the world. And it's a topic that more and more people are becoming interested in. It's also a topic that we're seeing collide with politics from time to time around this issue of animal welfare, something that the Pope himself has weighed in on recently when he said that he thought that all animals should be treated with dignity. An added dimension to this that I find quite fascinating is that both there's big money being spent both to protect the status quo and to change the status quo. And here's just an example of that. And this headline on the right is not made up. That's an actual story recently about vegan mayo, which is mayo made without any eggs, and how there's an effort to um, limit the amount of sales of that particular type of mayo. Now, just like issues of politics or religion, you know, talking to people about eating meat and what we should and shouldn't be eating is a pretty controversial issue. It's pretty taboo in a lot of ways. And when I was putting together this presentation and thinking about this session here today, I was reminded of posters like this. You know, it's easy to see posters that tell us to support clean energy in America or change our light bulbs or buy green power. But when it comes to talking about food, that's an issue that a lot of nonprofits and government agencies and others really shy away from. And I think part of the reason for that is they don't want to be classified as being extreme. And whether or not you think PETA is extreme is a whole other discussion that we may or may not get into as we go along today. But when we talk to people about what they should and shouldn't eat, it's definitely controversial. But we're going to get into that question today. We're going to try and tackle this question of what should I eat anyway. And I just had a, a quick survey, though, I want to do with the audience here before we get started. So I'm curious how many of you are vegetarians. OK, so quite a few of you are actually vegetarians. And how about vegans? Do we have a few vegans in the audience? OK, so there are a few vegans, too. Here's the thing. This room is not representative of the rest of the United States population. The most recent survey that I found from this past summer showed that about 3.4% of the US population over the age of 18 is a vegetarian. And only about one in every 240 people is a vegan. So we'll see as we go along today if you decide to join one of those groups or maybe even to leave one of those groups. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our featured panel for the day. So I'm going to pause and introduce them now. Uh, Katie Kasner is a um, what's her page here? registered dietitian, also a licensed dietitian, and she's a nutritionist and health coach here at the university with the Boynton Health Service. And so I'm really happy to have her perspectives on the panel here today. In the middle, we have Dave Tillman. And Dave, as many of you know, is a Regents Professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior. He's also one of the very first INE resident fellows and one of the world's leading ecologists. So Dave, thanks for being here also today. And finally, uh, last but not least, is uh, Tracy Deutsch. Tracy is an associate professor in the Department of History. She also studies food and agriculture uh, through the Youth Agri-Food Collaborative and the Graduate Group in Food Studies. Uh, she's written extensively about the history of food. And she's teaching a really amazing class that if I had any free time at all, I'd be taking <laughs> right now on food in history. And it looks really amazing. So for, for the students out there, definitely check that out too. All right, so I wanted to start with a couple of questions for each of you. And maybe Tracy will begin with a bit of the historical perspective on these issues. Uh, you were mentioning something to me really fascinating before we talked about, before we um, started the panel here today in a conversation we had. And there was the idea that um, this isn't the only time that we've seen this surge in meat consumption. There have been times in the past when per capita consumption in the US in particular has been pretty high. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what some of the drivers for meat consumption have been. Yeah. So in, what's interesting to me historically is 
all of the different factors has, that have gone into meat consumption over time. One of the things that I studied was the politics around food provisioning and food shopping in the early part of the 20th century, and so that overlapped, the end of that project was World War II, and that was a time when meat was rationed, right? So you would think that meat consumption would go down, which in the aggregate among civilians, it did, but per capita, meat and protein consumption increased during the war because it was distributed more equitably. So some people experienced a decline in what they ate, but more people had access to it precisely because it was rationed so you couldn't buy just as much as you wanted. And that really opened my, my eyes to the ways in which politics and policy determines, and has always determined, even when it's not a war situation, what people eat and what's available. So the drivers aren't only around changing um, tastes and such, right. but there are all those other drivers that we've been talking about too. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, Dave, I'm really curious because your research, it seems like, has shifted a little bit recently with some of the papers you've been publishing and some of the work you've been doing, looking at more of the impacts of a Western diet on issues of you know, the environment and biodiversity. And just wondering, you could talk a little bit more about this shift um, in terms of the focus on what people eat impacts on health, and well, why that change a little bit? Well, um, agriculture is, uh, has huge environmental impacts. It's uh, uh, 25 to 30% of all the greenhouse gas we emit. Uh, it uh, is responsible for uh, serious impacts on water quality, uh, groundwater, lakes, river streams, the ocean, pesticide release. Uh, it's uh, the major cause of habitat destruction and loss of biological diversity around the world. And so um, if you care about these issues, it's much more fun to try to find solutions than to talk about the, than to only talk about the problems. And so um, I heard a talk uh, that uh, Walter Willett, who's a nutritionist at Harvard gave, and uh, it occurred to me that the diets that he was uh, suggesting that were very healthy for people also might have uh, some health benefits for the environment. And that led Chris Clark and I to explore that issue. And there really is uh, some pretty strong overlap. Um, so I'll talk more about that, but that's sort of an introduction. And Katie, I'm really curious, you know, um, from a health and nutrition perspective, is there something unique about meat that's really critical to our diets and our health? Or, um, I mean, we often hear that, you know, we can get similar nutrients and such from other, other materials, but is there something about meat that we just need as part of our, part of our diet? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so as far as nutrients found in meat, meat's obviously really high in protein, um, but the amount of protein that the average American gets is far above the amount of protein we actually need. Um, I would say if we're looking at more micronutrients, probably the two biggest ones that we're getting from meat that are more difficult to get in non-meat sources uh, would be iron, the type of iron, heme iron. Um, although you can get non-heme iron, which is less absorbed um, than, than the heme iron from vegetarian sources. Uh, but for the majority of people, they're actually okay with just non-heme iron, especially men. We rarely see iron deficiencies in men um, unless there's some internal bleeding going on in women. Um, yeah, sometimes that heme iron is is much more beneficial, uh, but with the science we have today, supplementation and pairing with vitamin A, it, it's, you, can, you can get it without having to eat meat. Uh, the other one is vitamin B12. So if we're just talking meat, um, not, not a vegan diet, um, there's no issues with vitamin B12. If somebody is vegan, there are no vegetarian foods that naturally have B12. Um, so supplementing again with our science today, you, you don't need meat. And, and how far over that recommended amount for protein are we? I'm assuming that's just a, a U.S. based number. Then. Well, so the amount of protein a person needs is based on their body weight. Um, all other macronutrients, uh, carbs, fat, are based on your energy expenditure. So how many calories you need. Um, protein is used for cell regeneration. So depending on how many cells you have, you need a different amount of protein. Um, so a good rule of thumb is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. If you're vegetarian, 
you need a little bit more protein, one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. But sharing and proteins are less bioavailable, so we don't absorb them quite as well. Um, but how far over are we? You know, I don't know the exact numbers, but if I had to guess, I think men are much more over than women. Um, I think I've heard numbers around 90 grams of protein per day is average for men, maybe 60, mid-60s average for women. Um, the amount we really need is probably quite a bit less than that. So just a, a personal note, I was really curious about this question because as a vegetarian, many of you probably get this question of where you get your protein from. And uh, as a lead up to this session, and you know we were, we were gonna do this, I kept a food journal for a month and was surprised that as a vegetarian I was averaging, and, and not being vegan obviously makes a big difference here, um, averaging about 120 grams yeah. of protein a day. And even Good. falling back to a vegan diet, it was still like 70, 75, which seemed to be above where we should be. If I, yeah, if, if I just chime in, if you, if you look at uh, the total amount of, of meat that the typical American eats is about three times uh, the amount of meat in uh, a much healthier diet than we have the Mediterranean diet. And so people with Mediterranean diets tend to have less diabetes, less heart disease, uh, a little bit less cancer, uh, eating a third of the meat that we eat. So that's a, a different measure of it. Uh, Tracy, you have an article in process I saw in the, the notes we were sharing back and forth about how past matters and uh, how the past matters contemporary food discussions and debates, and we were also talking about how this question of should we eat meat is not really all that new, it's been happening throughout time. So what can we learn from the past about where we might be going into in the future? Well, unfortunately, one thing we can learn is that it's really hard to- uh, your microphone. Oh, is that on? Is that on now? No. Uh, yeah. How about that? Hold it down. Yeah. Um, well, your light doesn't work. Well. Okay, now um, So, I was saying that unfortunately one thing we can learn is that it's really hard to predict the future. Um, <laughs> because things change and they can change very quickly. So that's one contribution I think history gives us in thinking about how well we can predict what's going to happen. I think though that one thing we can also learn from history is that meat has been a charged object in people's lives for a very, very long time. The, the concerns have differed across time and place quite extensively, but the idea that there's something different and special about eating animals, and that perhaps that means that they ought to be eaten differently or not eaten at all, or that some of them should not be eaten, that's a very, very old idea. And so when we think about the, the environmental imperatives to change meat, I think we need to give credence to the ways in which meat has become deeply embedded in social, social and cultural beliefs and also social and cultural institutions, um, including practices of daily life. So that's, I'm really struck by how long people have been asking this exact question. <laughs> I'm gonna come to the audience for some questions in just a moment here. Um, Dave, another question I have for you is that it seems to me there's a, there's a few research papers that have come out recently or on the horizon coming out, arguing one way or another that species loss around the world is being exasperated by our consumption of meat and production of meat. What, what does the research tell you on that question? Well, um, the, the future increases in species loss will be pretty much tied to land use. Of all the species that the IUCN red list lists as endangered, 79% uh, are endangered because of agricultural land clearing. It is the, the number one factor that's threatening species. And if we continue on with diets changing as they have been, and the, the dietary change around the world, uh, as people become wealthier, they sort of reveal their preferences, as, as economists might say, they tend to eat more calories per day, uh, and uh, they tend to have these calories uh, come from foods that are less healthy, they tend to eat more sugars, fats, uh, oils, and alcohol, uh, and they tend to eat more meat. And the sharpness of these relationships is amazing if you, sort of uh, average across, uh, divide the world into, uh, let's say, eight different groups okay. which are economically similar to each other, and look at how their meat per capita, meat consumption has depended on income. It's been this incredibly tight curve, going from about five grams of meat protein for the poorest people to 30 some grams of meat protein per day for the richest people. And, and, and we have dots for every year from 1960 to now, and you see these, these diets marching up. There's some exceptions, India is very low, but otherwise, 
there, there seems to be a very strong preference uh, for meat. Now, because as you pointed out in your, in your introduction, it takes a lot of uh, grain to produce meat um, or a lot of land. We don't have enough pasture land to double meat on pasture land. And we're basically out of that. Uh, that the net effect of having diets that are going along this tr established trajectory of how it changes with income is that we're going to have to clear uh, an area about the size of the United States, 800 million hectares of land around the world uh, to meet projected food demand. If instead people had diets that were like the Mediterranean diet, we'd cut that amount in half, which is the Mediterranean diet has, uh, as I said, about a third of the meat consumption of typical American. If they had a, a, a pescatarian diet, it would even be lower, a fish bias diet. If they had a vegetarian diet, there's almost no need to clear more land. So there are huge effects of diet on the, on the ability of the earth to sustain the 5,000 species of, of, of mammals and birds that are currently threatened with extinction and the other many thousand that will join that club if we keep clearing land. Can I yeah, real quick? Uh, so I want to add on to this idea that people's consumption of meat increases in proportion to their income, which is certainly true of our current moment and it has been true of modern period, of the modern period. But it hasn't always been true historically. So when I was prepping for this talk, I was interested in, in the possibilities the past gave us and in some counterexamples. And one way, one way to think about meat consumption are the ways that it's been mediated and modified by social and cultural beliefs in very different times and places. So for instance, in um, China, in the early modern period, people who were wealthy ate better diets and they ate more calories, and that included eating meat, but the expectation was that you, would, my colleague in Chinese history calls them casual vegetarians. So they, would, they were vegetarians, but they didn't complain if their vegetables had been cooked in pork fats, for instance or if there had been pork in the broth or things like that. And I think that that, knowing that human history has not always been characterized by this upward curve in meat consumption can be helpful. I also think in a current moment, it's useful in some ways to ask why this is happening, why people's desire for meat increases with income. And I say this because there was just a really interesting study done in the Pacific Islands um, about this one, by anthropologists, about this one particular kind of meat that's called flat. It's um, sort of the back part of, my understanding is it's the back part of, of lambs and sheep and mutton. And it's not, it's a byproduct in Australia, in the US, and then shipped to poorer islands in the Pacific, where it's consumed in large quantities. And what the anthropologist, even though most people understand that it's not healthy and it's very bad, and the anthropologists in their field work realized that one reason people ate it so much was partly because they were used to it and it tasted good and it was part of their identity, but also because it felt modern to them to eat meat. So one reason that meat consumption increases with income is because meat consumption increases with income, right? And so meat takes on this aura. It's a, meat is embedded like other things. It, take, it has come to take on in the modern period beginning in the early 20th century, this aura of modernity as well. Quick question for Katie, and then I go out to the audience too. Something I've always wondered about, something I've always wondered about is, I'm not sure exactly how to ask this, but if there are different stages in life when eating meat becomes more important than other times. So for example, we have obviously a lot of adults in the room who made the decision to become vegetarians, but what about kids? I mean, are there concerns with kids who are, who are vegetarians at a younger age, perhaps, or is that not a concern, I guess? You know, pediatric nutrition is not my specialty, but um, really, no, there's not a, not a big concern at any stage of life following a vegetarian diet. Um, I think vegan probably would be more difficult to swing with really young children. Um, my guess would be under the age of two. It's probably not really recommended. Um, but for the most part, there, there is no age limit. As you get older, the amount of protein we absorb does go down. Um, so since meat protein is more bioavailable, um, more elderly people might, might do better having a little bit of meat in their diet, but, but certainly I don't, I don't think that's something that everybody has to do. Um, 
just, I think, being more aware of protein consumption as you age. And there certainly, as we've talked about, countries all around the world that aren't eating as much as much meat as we are right. to. I'm going to go to the audience for questions if you have some. I can comment. Um, on average, the the world from middle-income countries, the developing world, to uh, uh, through the richest countries, are as they increase meat production, more and more of it is being grain fed. So there are grasslands, and what uh, there's about uh, four billion hectares, four times the area of the United States, that are, are grasslands around the world that are, are pastures, grazing lands. Much of them are very dry, very low productivity. Um, work on grass-fed uh, ruminants, beef, uh, sheep, and so on, versus uh, um, industrially produced uh, CAFO animals, uh, suggests that they, they both still have this, in it, this uh, sort of unavoidable, current unavoidable uh, methane release problem, such as their greenhouse gas signatures are very, very high. So the greenhouse gas signature of beef per gram of protein in it is about 250 times the emission for the same amount of protein from a soybean about 50 times the same amount of protein from grains. So there's a huge uh, environmental impact that way. Grazing cattle, if it's unwisely, is a very gentle thing on the land. I mean, there used to be lots of other animals that were in North America until the Pleistocene mass extinction 10,000 years ago that were grazing these grasslands. And so done properly, grazing is a fairly environmentally benign uh, process to, to turn a very low quality food grass into a nutritionally higher quality food, beef or, or, or uh, lamb and so on. But if greenhouse gas is a big issue, uh, there's no way around the greenhouse gas release. And so, on. so environmentally, uh, fats and sugars are produced with very low impact. Sugar cane gives about twice as many calories per hectare of land as does uh, any of the grains. And then on the fat side, palm oil gives double what sugar uh, cane does per hectare. So if you just care about how, how much energy calories you get from an hectare of land, they're pretty low. And the environmental impacts of growing both of those, which are perennials, are low compared to growing wheat or corn. Uh, but that's not true for the health side. That's, that's your job. Yeah. So. <laughs> And so, I'm sorry, and your question one more time, it was it was asking um, what is the health implication of a Mediterranean diet, or? Yeah, so Dr. Tillman, Dr. Tillman talked about how um, they were healthier, but our, my question is, are they healthier because they're not eating meat, or are they healthier because they're eating less fat and sugar? Oh, I missed your and question. And what is the, you know, what are the environmental impacts of both of those? Well, I guess I don't know. I don't know the answer, if they're healthier because they're not eating meat or fat and sugar, but I'm sure it's a common. Yeah, it's, <laughs> let, let me, here's a dilemma on trying to understand why the diets that we know to be healthier are healthier. In each diet, people eat more of something and less of another. Are they healthier because they ate less of something or more of the other thing? And that's incredibly hard to separate out. There's been some research suggesting that, for instance, high sugar intake on its own right, no matter what else you're doing, is unhealthy. Uh, and there's been some suggestions that, that the wrong kind of fats are unhealthy. But that's, that's a little bit controversial again right now. So I'd say what we do know from following hundreds of thousands of people and what they've eaten for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years and a variety of different studies around the world is that there are certain combinations of food that we would call a diet. Diets like the Mediterranean where you eat a, 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 around eight to 10 servings per day of fruits and vegetables where you only have a serving of the, of the non-fish meat uh, about once a week where fish is your main source of animal protein uh, and where uh, the main fats you have are olive oil not other fats, and where uh, you eat about as many calories and nuts as you do in grains. Those kinds of diets have a really good signature, as do diets where people are purely vegetarian. I couldn't find enough data on vegan if to put in our study. We only have 5,000 vegan people, 5,000 people years of data on vegans. So we don't know what the, we, we don't by, know by the normal standards uh, what the health impacts of being vegan are. The data suggests that vegans had an even lower rate of diabetes uh, than did um, vegetarians but a higher rate of heart disease. But it's just, it's in the noisy realm now. We don't know if that means anything or, or, or yet or not. Uh, 
Um, I think, I mean, again, I think that me has been a charged topic for a long time. And one thing I kind of wanted to say is that when we look at these numbers of meat consumption, one thing that is harder to gauge is people's ambivalence about eating meat. Historically, I think a lot of those, those, those religious and ethical regulations around meat reflect a kind of ambivalence about meat consumption. Why it's charged now is, uh, historians like to say, that's outside my time period. Um, <laughs> but, but, so I'll put on my other hat, <laughs> which is as a gender studies scholar, um, I, th I think that one reason, although not the entire reason, has to do with the ways in which meat consumption has taken on this, this really weighty meaning as a marker of identity, and particularly of, the, of Western masculinity. That's one way to think about it, that the giving up meat involves giving up a lot of uh, a way to express the gender identity that is really important. Um, I mean, I wonder how we change the issue of, of what diets people choose and uh, toward diets that are healthier for them and better for the, for the environment. And um, I think, you know, food is so much of our culture. We, we, when we interact with people, we almost always have food with us. And we like to have around us the things that we, are, that we are familiar with and have had uh, throughout our lifetime. So I think that we have this, we have this cultural history that is, that is a very big driver of, of what we do and who we are. And I think that if you tell someone they should be eating meat, you're attacking their history, their culture, which I think is a, the inappropriate way to do it. I have no idea how to change what people eat. My only, I have one idea, which is a very simple one. Uh, it's when you invite them to your home, serve them the best tasting food that you know how to make, that you really love. And if it doesn't have meat in it, maybe they'll fall in love with it too, and they might try eating it. I think it's going to end up, people are always going to eat what they love. We're not going to have laws that are going to say you can't eat something. It's just not going to happen. That's not how humans are. And so my hope is that people will try other things and find the things they fall in love with, and they'll become part of the meal and uh, part of their dietary plan. And maybe through that, we can, we can shift what we eat. Because I think there are lots of things. I, when I go to a restaurant, I mean, I used to eat a lot of meat. I, I eat very little anymore except for, except for fish. I'm, I would say I'm a pescatarian, but I, I have to have a confession on stage here. Uh, but, um, but when I used to, I, was, I would find I liked the appetizers the more interesting than, mm -hmm. than eating the big hunk of meat in the plate. I didn't even care about the thing in the middle of my plate. It wasn't what excited me. It really was everything else. Like, and I love the flavors you can have from different kinds of fruits, different kinds of vegetables, different kinds of spices. So I think maybe other people are like me and they might fall in love with these things if they actually tried them but it's hard for them to try them if they're not part of their culture. I'll get back to you in five lifetimes. <laughs> um, it's, it's very possible to feed people even the diets they seem to want if you project these curves out and imagine they're somehow reflective of future behavior. It's possible to do it. Um, but then you added the word sustainable. Um, I think we could have a world that could do that for a long period of time. But it'd be a world that lost a large proportion of the remaining uh, larger animals on the world. Uh, a world that would have much higher greenhouse gas levels than they might want. And because of that, it may not be sustainable. It'd be a world with um, much more polluted waters may, than they might want to have because of the impacts to really produce that much food, we're going to have to double global crop production. And double global crop, crop production will lead to at least a doubling in fertilizer use around the world, which is, again, another major impact. So I think it is doable, but I don't think it's the kind of world that many people would, would really, uh, if they had their choice, would want to live on. So you sustainable agriculture? Well, that, that um, well, I don't know what we mean by sustainable agriculture. Um, we can, there are ways to do agriculture right now that can have retain the same yields, but lose, use about 30% less fertilizer in the, in the nations which have the highest rates of application. It's applying the right amount in the right area at the right time. That can help. And we can apply the right amount of pesticides at the right time uh, to help control weeds or, or fungi or whatever it might be. So that can reduce it a bit. Um, unless we greatly increase yields in the low yielding nations of the world, we're going to need a lot more land. It is those nations that have booming population, booming incomes, who are demanding the food, and most food is grown locally. 
Only about 10% of the food grown around the world is, is moved from one nation to another. Almost all food is grown within a nation. And that being the case, those nations are going to have to clear essentially all the land they have left that they could ever farm to feed their people unless they um, bring their yields up to sort of more modern, quote, industrial agricultural levels, which they could do wisely with much lower environmental impact than what we have right now in the United States, for instance. But that's sort of, those are the dilemmas. It's how do you change uh, how six billion people on the world grow their food? How do we get them to use fertilizer, to use them wisely, unlike how we might be doing it? Uh, how we get them to plow their fields in a wise way that minimizes erosion and so on, and just does all the things that we know will lead to sustainability. How we achieve that is a real issue. Could be done. I want to jump in real quick um, and think about, offer a way to think about this that isn't just about agriculture and changing those kinds of systems, um, which is to think about the work of provisioning and cooking. Um, so one thing about meat consumption in our current setting is that in some ways it's easier than having a vegetarian diet. Um, so one way to switch more people to Um, so one reason, one way to switch more people to uh, a more, more of a vegetarian diet or a more sustainable diet is to create more infrastructure that supports that kind of diet, to make those foods easier to get, cheaper to eat, easier to cook, to make them more available publicly and in the process, you know, all the way it's so easy to get meat. And in, even when I'm looking through popular magazines, half the recipes are for, rest, you know, Dinner in five minutes involves a pre-cooked chicken breast, right? So if we could imagine infrastructures that support a vegetarian or more sustainable diet, that's another thing. Yeah, so since I started here at Boynton about six years ago, um, I have always seen that College seems to be a time for experimentation with diets. Um, so a lot of students may be coming from a traditional family setting where you know they have the meat and the potato and the vegetable and they sit down together and eat that. Um, it was it was never a good time for them to switch to a vegetarian diet. It just would not jive with the family dynamic. Um, but coming to college, they're very interested and and test out a vegetarian diet. And it's usually at the urging of their parents that they come in to see me um, to make sure that to make sure they're not killing themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I do find I found in the last six years I, I can't speak to before that, um, but ever since I started, it's been a lot of students experimenting with their diets, a lot of vegetarian, vegan, um, but then also a lot of different. I, I don't even follow all the diets, so I can't name them all, but a lot of paleo type uh, diet um, trends coming in, a lot of juicing, a lot of, um, I think there's one called the Whole30. I think, I think the biggest movement I see, see is people tend to go towards more clean eating. Um, so just kind of getting back to the basics, cooking with real food, which is great to see. Um, well, again, I think we have to think about the systems in which vegetarian and vegetable eating and cooking is embedded. Like Katie, you mentioned going back to, to cooking, right? Um, which is great. I like to cook at home too, but it requires time. It requires a life that allows you to spend that time cooking. And not, not everyone has that choice and not everyone makes that choice. So again, I think creating understanding that this is a social change as well as a dietary change and also as a structural social change right in terms of how we spend our time and where our labor goes is individually but that's also a social and communal kind of decision that i think has has effects on the amount of vegetables we can That's a good question. I, I believe that it's almost entirely um, more about the system than what the individual knows. I think 
almost everybody, with an exception of a few people that I've seen, but almost everybody knows what they should be eating. Everybody knows what's, what's good to eat. So it has nothing to do with um, understanding, and I think it has everything to do with, you know, do you have access to a grocery store? Do you have enough money in your bank account to get to the grocery store? Or are you, you know, just going down to um, whatever restaurants on the corner, McDonald's, and, and what vegetarian options do they have? Not a whole lot. So I think it has a lot to do more with, with the environment we live in um, than individual knowledge. One way to think about it is those ethical considerations are older in terms of meat consumption than okay. those ethical considerations are older than the environmental considerations around meat. And, and I think that we are hearing and learning more and more about new ways of thinking about animals as beings that have consciousnesses and that feel pain. And that to me resonates with long standing concerns that people have had about eating meat. I, I'm waffling a little bit because personally I'm coming to terms with this information myself, right? Like other people. But I but I am struck in the people I encounter by how increasingly that's an issue in the way that it did it used to be. So I'll give one quick anecdote in my food history class. I start out by talking about transatlantic slavery, and um, and and I talk about the ways in which enslaved people were dehumanized in that in the course of that trade, and one totally without my asking, one of my students who grew up had grown up on a, uh, a ranch said, "That's like animals." And we didn't do anything with it much in class, but it was really striking to me that he, that this young person would have that response. If I could just have another quick response, and that is there are there are a whole range of ethical issues that, that, that revolve around food, uh, or what we do with, with crops. Uh, the United States puts about 40% of our corn into cars, causing the price of corn to be higher, which is undeniably so, uh, and which makes uh, other grains high, uh, expensive, and the bottom billion people in the world, the billion poorest people, most of whom have to buy their food in stores, end up being less able to ride themselves with nutrition, which is why 800 million of them uh, are malnourished. And so I think it's actually putting ethanol in your car tank, I would assert, is an is a unethical act. say if I were a major U.S. corporation trying to sell processed foods to people and I see that the sale of the traditional items are dropping for some of the big companies, uh, I would try to find diets that the younger generation really cares about, which would probably be ones biased more toward these kinds of foods, which would address your concern about having uh, the having be a ready availability of, of the food items that are lower on the food chain, uh, I would assert often are tastier and so on. So. Uh, I don't know how this, this will be, what will turn how things happen. Um, but I do think that the biggest chance for change will be from companies realizing there's a big profit to be made by, by marketing to these people. And by doing that, putting effort into making these the best tasting, healthiest things they can come up with. Again, that's really interesting to me as somebody who thinks about how food takes on these, these other associations and these other meanings. Um, I always, I, I, I'm a tea drinker, I'll just come out with that. Um, and, and I'm always telling, but I really need that caffeine. 
And I'm always saying to people, everyone thinks tea drinkers are nicer than coffee drinkers, but we're not. <laughs> we are very demanding. And I, I feel that way a little bit about um, vegetarianism, that it, it has taken on this association of, on the one, you know, the positive meat, the positive correlation is someone who is ethical and depending on their political leanings, also progressive. Um, but also the connotation of someone who's holier than thou or more spiritual or sort of impractical in some way or female, right? And I think that those kind of qualities line up for a reason. Or, or I should say female or feminized in Western culture, right? In other words, non-white. Um, there's a long history to, to the association of those qualities and vegetarianism gets attached to these Characteristics that have that have already come to be associated with each other in Western culture and it resonates. question we should all ask ourselves and I think the uh, at least the answer I would have for everything I've learned from reading the nutritional literature and knowing what I know about the environmental impacts of diet is that if we eat meat we should eat a lot less and we should probably bias it toward the kinds of meats which have lower environmental impact which would be uh, on animal products eggs and dairy are the, are the two lowest of all the meat based things for their environmental impact uh, followed by uh, fish that's caught by um, uh, on, basically on lines in the ocean, um, uh, chicken and pork. Those are all the things which are much better when it gets to any of the ruminants of beef, uh, uh, goat, lamb, uh, the environmental impacts are huge. At least the greenhouse gas impacts, but also some other environmental impacts. So I would say um, the, the, the question should be asked at least is how much meat I should eat. And the answer for most of it is, is a lot less. Um, so from, from a nutritional standpoint, should we eat meat? So I'm a very middle of the road dietitian. My, I truly feel that all foods fit. Um, and not to say that all foods are completely healthy for us. Um, but we were talking about the emotional side and, and there is a huge emotional connection we have to food that we can't disregard. Um, and so, you know, we eat because we're happy, we're sad, or, you know, whatever the emotion is, and, and that's okay sometimes. Um, we should also do other things when we're happy or sad sometimes. <laughs> um, but, but to kind of echo what he said, we should eat less meat, absolutely. Um, certainly less red meat. From a health standpoint, we see the most chronic diseases associated with red meat consumption. Um, cancer, heterocyclic amines that are formed when we, when we cook the red meat have, have a higher risk of producing colon cancer in particular. Um, and so, and also red meat is more associated with a high BMI, obesity, being overweight, which is 
correlated with all of those diseases as well. Um, chicken has actually a better fat profile. It's, it's lower in fat, but it also has a better type of fat too, um, less saturated fat than red meat. So uh, we should eat less meat, more chicken, um, if we are eating meat, and more plant-based proteins. I think Americans don't know what to do with beans a lot of times. They don't know what to do, how to cook some of these different foods. Um, and so having a more plant-based diet is certainly better. So I'll just say quickly that I think when we ask a question, like should we eat meat or not, we should ask what's the change that we think not eating meat is gonna make and think about making that change through, maybe through not eating meat and through other areas of our lives that, that make that change. Great, well thank you very much. Uh, let's give our panelists a big round.